My name is John Sylvester. I'm Australia's longest serving crime reporter and write a weekly column for The Age. Many of my colleagues have wondered why I've never bothered to move to other areas of the paper. The reason's pretty simple. I've got the best job in journalism, playing cops and robbers and getting paid for it. Over more than 40 years, I've covered some of Australia's biggest crimes and met fascinating characters on both sides of the law. In this series, you'll hear from them, the cops and the crooks, telling their stories. Welcome to my world. Welcome to Naked City. In the early hours of Wednesday, October 12, 1988, Police Divisional Van Paran 311 answered a routine call to an abandoned car in Wall Street, South Yarrow, a narrow suburban street of Melbourne. That's number 150. Uh, situation report at the moment. We have the Paran van here, uh, the vehicle's here. The two members are from the Paran van. There are no other members missing. Uh, just to clarify that, the ambulance has arrived and uh, most of the members look pretty bad. What you just heard is the police radio call when units arrived to find Constable Stephen Tynan dead and Damien Eyre dying. In this episode, part two of the Wall Street killings, we'll examine the investigation and find new evidence implicating one of the men acquitted of the double murder. It began with an abandoned white Holden Commodore. Hey, it's right, if you can slip down to Walsh, Wall Street in uh, South Yarra. Two young policemen who were in the area responded to the report of an abandoned car. They were the unlucky targets of a calculated payback by a ruthless armed robbery gang that wanted to kill. In police terms, the two uniform members who arrived first were just kids. Stephen Tynan had been a police officer for two years and nine months. Damien Eyre, 20, was from a police family. He'd been in the job for just six months after graduating from the academy in April 1988. It took about seven minutes for the pair to reach the suspect's sedan after receiving the call to attend. When they got to the scene, they spotted a white Commodore dumped in the street. What they didn't see was a group of gunmen hiding in the dark, waiting to murder the first police to arrive. They didn't care who they were, as long as they were cops. Yeah, South Melbourne 150, I sent uh, Pran 311 down to Wall Street. Uh, since then I've had about three or four cards come down saying that they've heard shots fired in that street. And I can't get Pran 311 at this stage. Tynan parked the divisional van behind the Holden. Both vehicles were facing north. Air got out of the passenger side of the van and walked to the car. He glanced at the registration sticker on the front window and jotted down the number and expiry date on a sheet of paper in his clipboard. At the same time, his partner went to the open driver's door and stood behind the wheel. Air then walked around the car and squatted next to Tynan, who was still in that car. They would have seen the ignition lock was broken, so the car couldn't have been started with a key. Tynan had started to get out of the car when the shotgun blast hit him with deadly force, throwing him back into the stolen vehicle. He collapsed with his head between the front bucket seats. It was 4.48am. A murder, any murder, is handled by the on-call homicide squad crew headed by a detective senior sergeant. This time, the officer in charge was John Noonan. Later, when police set up the Thai Air Task Force, John Noonan was the joint head that had to catch the killers. I caught up with John when we returned to the crime scene. It was a lovely day. You'd hear the birds in the trees and the noise of traffic as people went about their days. It was hard to believe what had happened there more than 30 years earlier. Well, this is the scene of one of the most infamous acts ever committed in Victoria Police history. So you were on call at the time. When did you get the call to come to Wall Street? Yeah, well, back on, on the 11th of October, um, I was on call also and uh, had been out to a, a shooting where uh, police had shot a fellow uh, by the name of Graham Jensen out at Narry Warren. We looked at the shooting of Graham Jensen in Narry Warren in last week's episode. Have a listen if you missed it. And finished that about 2 o'clock in the morning on the 12th uh, and then got a call about 5.30 in the morning on the 12th of October 
uh, for the members being shot in Wall Street. So you arrived here, and what was the scenario? Look, it was uh, there was a lot of uh, confusion at the at the scene when we first arrived. A lot of the, uh, the scene hadn't been blocked off. So we had a lot of media uh, in the scene, and and we had a lot of people that shouldn't have been in the scene. So uh, it, it was just uh, one of confusion and, and one of um, total disbelief by a lot of the people that had, uh, that had been here earlier. Reconstructing the crime, what happened next? We had uh, Steve Tynan sitting behind the wheel and Damien Eyre checking, uh, checking the registration label. We believe that um, Stephen has, has more than likely seen the, uh, the vehicle had been hot wired and called out to Damien to come and have a look. Uh, as they're both engaged in, uh, in, in that process, um, discussing it, uh, you've got Stephen sitting in the seated position behind the wheel, Damien uh, over crouched down, at, obviously engaged in what he was uh, showing him. Uh, and the offenders have come across without being noticed and the first thing that Stephen would have uh, seen probably is a, is a shotgun because as he's turned his head uh, he's been shot in the, in the head. So he died in instantly? He would have died instantly, yes. Air began to rise from the squatting position when he was shot across the back and upper left shoulder also with a shotgun. It should have been enough to stop anyone but Damien somehow rose and turned to face the attacker. He grabbed the gunman and fought for his life. Even though he was seriously, but not fatally wounded, Air continued to fight on. As uh, has, he's come on the rise, he's been shot across his back. He's then tried to fight, certainly grabbed hold of uh, a weapon. Until a second man slipped up next to him and grabbed the policeman's service .38 revolver from its holster, put it to the policeman's head and fired. Another offender has walked up behind Damien and taken his, his revolver out of his holster and then shot him at close range to the head and body. Air collapsed and was shot again in the back as he lay next to the rear driver's side window of the stolen car. He was already dying when the second revolver bullet hit him from point blank range. It all took about a minute. Police believe the shotgun discharged twice more, once hitting the wall of a Wall Street house. That's confirmed by the fact that another shot has discharged and, and hit a nearby building. At 4.49am, police started to get the first calls from residents with reports of gunfire. The police radio captures the horrible scene they found at Wall Street. The two members are from the Paran van. There are no other members missing. Uh, just to clarify that, the ambulance has arrived and uh, the members look pretty bad. And the two people that were seen heading out towards Punt Road are likely the offenders, aren't they? Two things indicated the killers weren't car thieves. The car was abandoned in the street for a long time, and the killers had come from behind the police as they examined the vehicle. Any thieves could have easily escaped without shooting police, slipping into the darkness. At that point, did you think it was a deliberate ambush? Look, that's what it seemed, uh, certainly, with a, um, certainly the obvious first thoughts were that it, that's straight out ambush, um, and uh, the offenders have just sat back and waited for whoever attend, to attend and, and have a look at the car. There was no reasonable doubt that the two young policemen were victims of a terrorist-type attack. It was obvious that the gunman planned to kill police at random because there was no way of knowing who was going to turn up at Wall Street. Detectives drew up a list of those they believed had sufficient hatred of police to launch such a premeditated random attack. The list was surprisingly short. You're comfortable you know who the offenders were? Yes. Uh, and what was the motive? The motive was uh, certainly was payback for, for the shooting uh, by police by the armed robbery squad of Graham Jensen the night before. So you believe that it was friends of Jensen? We certainly believe uh, they were associates of Jensen, uh, you know, friends and associates, uh, criminal associates, yes. So who were involved that you know of? Uh, Victor Pearce, uh, Jed Horton uh, and Peter McAvoy and, and, uh, and also uh, Trevor Pennigle. The most logical view, favoured by investigators, was that the double murder was a direct payback for the death of murder suspect Graham Jensen. Police had already received intelligence that one gang of crooks believed the armed robbery squad was deliberately killing known bandits, and so they created their so-called two-for-one pact. If police killed one of theirs, they would kill two of them. Peter Butts was part of the armed robbery squad involved in the botched arrest attempt 
of Graham Jensen. He remembers hearing the news about Wall Street and told me how he felt at that moment. 13 hours after uh, Jensen was killed was Wall Street. Yep. Um, how did you and the people in the arrest team feel when it started to look as though it was a payback for Jensen? I first heard of the Wall Street uh, shootings in the 6am news uh, following the shooting of Jensen the day, the day after. And immediately my first thought was, this is a payback. I had no doubt in my mind that that was a payback for Jensen shooting. And how did you feel emotionally at that Terrible. Time? Terrible. It was a terrible feeling to, to know that, that criminals in, the, in this society had acted on their own uh, gut feeling, for the want of a better word, to take the law into their own hands and start pursuing innocent police for a reason they believed that their comrade and friend, uh, Graham Jensen, had been shot unlawfully by people from the Arm Robbery Squad. To investigate the Wall Street murders, police set up the Thai Air Task Force, a combination of the two surnames of the officers killed. It was the biggest investigation Victoria Police had ever undertaken at the time and also the longest running, spanning 895 days, almost three years. Police investigations revealed the shotgun used to perform the murders had been used in a bank robbery seven months earlier. The robbers, part of a gang known as the Flemington Crew, were seen on CCTV and they left shotgun shells at the scene. Seven months into the investigation, the shotgun itself was found half buried in an inner city golf course plant bed by a gardener. The shotgun and shells became the single forensic link police had to the Flemington Crew. Members of the gang responsible for the robberies were believed to be Victor Pearce, Graeme Jensen, Jed Horton and Peter David McAvoy. The police eventually laid charges, but the case still had a long way to go. Five men were charged over the Wall Street shootings. Two others, Jed Horton and Gary Abdullah, were also believed to be involved, but they'd already been shot dead by police. Four of those charged stood trial in the Supreme Court. Victor Pearce, his half-brother Trevor Pettingle, Peter David McAvoy and Anthony Farrell. The fifth, Jason Ryan, had been indemnified to give evidence against his former friends. Pearce, Pettingle and Farrell were all part of the notorious Alan Pettingle clan, a family that lived like the Beverly Hillbillies. That's if the Beverly Hillbillies were a pack of psychopaths. McAvoy was a convicted rapist, a bully and a coward. The accused men chose to give unsworn evidence, which was their right at the time. But this meant the prosecution couldn't cross-examine them. They said there was no way they were involved in the murders. There were nearly 100 witnesses, but the key ones were to be Victor's wife, Wendy, and Jason Ryan. She made a series of statements implicating her husband and others in the murders and was put into witness protection. This is a police tape where she's speaking with Inspector Dave Sprague about witness protection. 1.35 and it's Wednesday the uh, 9th, 9th of August 1989. This is a, uh, a conversation between uh, Inspector Sprague, uh, Wendy Pearce and uh, Detective McLaren in relation to uh, an agreement or a, an undertaking that uh, was entered by Wendy on the uh, 16th of July 1989. Wendy, all I want to do... Wendy, up until this point, had been cooperative. I understand I must be completely truthful in entering the Victoria Police Crown Witness Protection Scheme and I will not hold back any facts. Well, that's quite clear from what you've already said so far, that what you've told us is that you're obviously uh, not holding anything back. And was prepared to give evidence. Dear Chief Commissioner, Mr Cal Clare, I am writing to you in regard to the safety of myself and my three children, Chris, Victor and Katie. As you know, I have been in your protection and crown witness scheme since the 16th of July 1989. I put myself and my children in this scheme after many talks with Sprague and McLaren. In return for coming into the scheme, I have agreed to tell everything I know about the Wall Street killings of two policemen. For the past four weeks, I have been doing interviews with Sprague and McLaren nearly every day. I have told everything I know about Wall Street. I have also told about 12 armed robberies involving Victor Pearce, 
Jill Horton, Peter McAvoy and Graeme Jensen. I've also told... In this meeting, she says she fears for her and her children's lives and wants to be relocated overseas as soon as possible. I wish to change your stance on that at all. You want to be re relocated overseas? Overseas. What, what, have, you, have you got genuine fears, Wendy, just in case people... Uh... Yes, I have. And who, 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 is your, who do you see as your, your biggest threat? Um, Victor's family. Yes. Um, and also friends. Um, and some police officers. And, and he's got an extensive criminal network, hasn't he? Your, your husband, or your common law husband. Yes and his family. Yes. And uh, you've detailed some horrific crimes over the, the past four weeks, haven't you? Yes. Have you got any, any doubt in your mind of uh, what will be taking place at the moment in relation to discussions about yourself? With Victor? What discussions? With, with the family. What, 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 would they be, uh, what would they be up to at the moment, in your mind? Would they be planning something to do with my... Would they be planning something um, in regards to the kids? Not to get at the children first, and then me possibly. And, and when you say get at you, what, what what are they likely to do if they got uh, knowledge of where you were? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd be killed. Yeah, no doubt at all. No doubt at all. If you like this podcast, subscribe and rate it. Very highly, obviously. Tell your friends. I love you for it. By the time of the trial, she'd changed her mind and refused to give evidence to support her statements. The police case was terminally damaged when Wendy changed sides. The murder trial lasted seven weeks. It took the 12-man jury six days to make a decision. On March 26, 1991, the jury filed back into the Supreme Court. The foreman announced four verdicts. Not guilty. Neil Comrie, then Chief Commissioner, recalls the verdict. How did you feel when you heard that the, the people charged with Wall Street had been acquitted? Well, I think in some ways you'd have to say that the ultimate outcome of the Wall Street charges uh, was somewhat predictable. Uh, when you have to rely on the evidence of criminals, um, criminal family members, and cronies of criminals as your so-called star witnesses, and they recant the evidence that they've uh, previously given, I think you have to understand that a conviction in the Wall Street case was always going to be very difficult. And, and how did you feel? Um, well, like most members of the Victoria Police Force, uh, and I'm sure I speak for the members of the, uh, the families and the broader Victorian community, very, very disappointed. But... Under our system of justice, I think that was an outcome that we could probably uh, predict. Many years later, Wendy admitted to me that Victor was the brains behind Wall Street. Victor was the organiser, she would finally confess to me. In this morning's Age newspaper, she was quoted as saying she'd lied to protect the four men accused of killing police officers Stephen Tynan and Damien Eyre in the now infamous Wall Street shootings back in 1988. Give me some type of closure, uh, whether it gives Wendy Pearce any satisfaction or not, I don't know. But... Victor Pearce, Trevor Pettingill, Peter McAvoy and Anthony Farrell were all charged but later acquitted of the police murders. At the time, Wendy Pearce refused to testify, but now she says the two young officers were gunned down as payback after the death of Victor Pearce's best friend, Graham Jensen. I always loved Victor, she said. I was never going to give evidence against him. If she can sleep a little bit better at night, well, so it be. Uh, but I've had a lot of sleepless nights in the last 17 years myself. In the tell-all interview, Miss Pearce claimed her husband never showed remorse for the police killings. He just said they deserved their whack. It could have been me. I think it's really sad that she uh, didn't tell the truth when she had the opportunity to. There was outrage when Wendy Pearce appeared with police appealing for witnesses to come forward to help solve her husband's murder. The fact there was a $100,000 award angered many. Too poor to sue and with no reputation to defend, she was roundly pilloried on radio, television and in the papers. Eventually, she went on Darren Hinch's radio program to try and defend herself. Hinch on Drive. And on the line, the widow of the executed uh, gangster, uh, Victor Pierce. Wendy Pierce, good afternoon. 
Yes, good afternoon. Now, I've called you a gangster's mole, and I said you're hypo- a hypocritical and sensitive, self-centred bitch. What do you say to that? Well, I say that um, it's got nothing to do with what you've got to say today has got nothing to do with what I did today. I did this reward for my children and grandchildren. That's got nothing to do with you calling me those words. Well, that's what you are. Well, we've got this wonderful picture of you in the age with the crucifix on the wall, etc. Excuse me, the crucifix on the wall is for my husband's coffin. Mm -hmm. I'm holding that. Mm, Does that mean I've gone to God? I don't think so. Okay, well, a policeman caught up, a serving policeman caught up about 10 minutes ago and said, if you are so concerned now for your children and for a reward to be there... I'm not concerned for my children. I want closure for my children. Okay, okay. Well, if you want closure for your children, why don't you come clean and tell people what really happened in Wall Street when your husband... Was one of the killers. What as Wall Street? Oh, so you're saying my husband was one of the killers? Yes, I am. He's acquitted. So you're judged to kill you. Frank Eyre, the father of Damien Eyre, always felt justice was never served and fought for an inquest into the murders. For the Tynan and Eyre families, the fight for justice never ended. In 2010, they applied for a new inquest to be held into the shooting. Last year, a coroner ruled against it, saying there was no new evidence. Nothing is going to help the fact that those boys aren't here. It's just, it's just having the facts on the table and, and having them there for history. 25 years on, Crime Stoppers is still receiving calls about Wall Street. As long as the case is open, the Tynan and Air families will hold that hope that justice will be served. If I've got to live to 110, I'll hang on until I get some justice. Even now, John Noonan wants the facts put on the record. In failing that, there's never been an inquest. Do you think there should be one? Look, I think everyone's entitled to an inquest, that, uh, that particularly someone that's, that, that's been murdered in, in such a cowardly, callous uh, fashion, and they've never, ever been given the, uh, the rights of every other citizen, and, and they should have, should have been given it. Uh, it's now 24 years, and we still haven't had an inquest into the, into the murders. And there's lots of things that could be can- canvassed at that, at that inquest, um, both for the defence as, as for the prosecution. But the facts would come out, the truth would come out, so that the, the deaths are, are duly recorded as to, as to the factual information as to what happened. With the changes to the double jeopardy laws, there has been some talk of actually charging McAvoy again. What do you think would happen if, if, if that did happen? Look, I would, I would like to, uh, to see uh, McAvoy put up uh, on, on the, uh, the murders of Steve, uh, Steve Tynan and, and Damien Eyre. Um, I think there's, uh, there's sufficient evidence there that would, uh, would certainly um, give the prosecution case a strong case of, uh, of being successful. Peter David McAvoy's brother, Jeff, is a former policeman and prison officer. He gives us a new insight into the crook they called the Pink Panther and Bubble Brain. Jeff, John Sylvester. Hey, mate, here you go. Good. Your brother, Peter David McAvoy, was one of the four who was um, accused and stood trial over the Wall Street murders. What was Peter like? Oh, I think he was just an average kid, you know, where there were three boys in the family and he was he was just one of them. He had his own mates and everything else. He had the best education as a three of us. And when did he go off the rails? Well, he, uh, he got himself a drive while disqualified when he was... Um, when he was just on his P's and uh, that got him 14 days in Penridge and I remember him coming home and saying I'll never go back there again what a terrible place well you know how wrong was he coming uh, coming to a head with uh, being being charged with the uh, with the Wall Street matter you know although the, although they're found not guilty it uh, as others have said it doesn't mean they weren't the guys who did it what's your view oh I, I'm convinced they did it I'm convinced they did it, you know. He's, uh, he's expounded his uh, beliefs on several occasions, both to members of the police force in a couple of states. The, uh, the evidence is that he said to those members, uh, you know, the sweetest sound I ever heard was the words of the second copper dying. Over 10 years ago, around 12 years ago, he and I exchanged some text messages on one night and he went on in the text to say, you'll be like the second copper we offed or the second jack we offed saying, no, no, don't shoot. 
laying there saying, no, no, don't shoot. Well, I took that information to New South Wales Police and they created uh, a history of it called, they call it an event, and they attach an event number to it in New South Wales. And there were some documents I gave them which were screenshots of those texts. Now, I'm unaware whether the New South Wales Police forwarded that information onto the Victoria Police, but I do know that when I made an inquiry only a couple of years ago to the New South Wales Police to try and retrieve those documents, they indicated to me that the documents were in a storage facility in Lismore and that flood water had damaged that facility and destroyed that file. You know, the, the Wendy Pierce has, has said in her latest edition of evidence, she's uh, indicated, as, as you are probably aware, that um, uh, her husband uh, was uh, somewhat concerned because Peter kept the police revolver as a, a souvenir or as a, to use in other matters. You actually worked at Pentridge when he was in there. That must have been. That's right. He was there in there from time to time over that 10-year period. And I was in the control room at Jaika Jaika and it was, I was told there was a call for me and it was Peter. He was at large and he said to me, I hear you've been giving one of my mates in there trouble. I said, well, that has very, very little. Actually, it has nothing to do with you. And he said to me, well, just, just so you know, I know where you live. You know, like these are... This is your brother threatening yeah, you at work. Yeah. What, what about your parents, the poor devils? You know, it broke Dad. Both the parents are dead now, but Dad was a very proud man and uh, he felt like and like most parents would, that he was in some way responsible or, or um, made a mistake somehow in Peter's upbringing. You know, and, and parents do blame themselves. But uh, mum died uh, after dad and before her death, she specifically wrote him out of her will. Now, the procedures are to do that. You have to handwrite the reasons why. And that, is, that gets into a sealed envelope and attached to the will and only opened if uh, probate is challenged. And she wrote out six pages as to why her reasons were. And... Um, about two years after she died, Peter became aware of the fact that she'd died and he texted me and mum was a heavier woman and he said in the text, I'm coming up to get what's rightly mine, the stuff the fat slut didn't give me. So, you know, these are it's very disrespectful to say that about your parents, very disrespectful. You know, so this is just an indication of the general attitude so what you're saying is one of those morons was definitely your brother? Oh, I'm 100% convinced. Now, if he wants to make those admissions to me, he's got to expect me to take them on board. And he's made those admissions. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for talking to us. When the man with the biggest mouth, Peter McAvoy, was arrested in Newcastle, he bragged, the sweetest thing I ever heard was the police officer's last words while he was dying. Although they were acquitted... The Wall Street Four were found guilty in the court of karma and punished accordingly. Did they take their opportunity and go straight? Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, and as, uh, as confirmed by the fact that Victor Pearce was, was murdered by, uh, by another drug dealer uh, um, some years ago. Does it eat at you that they weren't convicted? Uh, you would certainly would want those persons to uh, have, have been convicted to, and got their just desserts. I suppose, through the courts. That didn't happen. Um, since then, um, uh, Victor Pearce has died the way he should have, just a callous, uh, callous criminal. Um, and, and he met his match uh, at the hands of another drug dealer. Uh, Jed Horton, um, I suppose you could say he was uh, sentenced by his own hand. Uh, Peter McAvoy, Peter McAvoy's a coward. He cringes at his own shadow now and, uh, and fears what's going to come around the corner uh, every second of the day, which is probably not a bad thing. Um, and Trevor Pennigal, well, Trevor's just a uh, lost, uh, lost soul in his own torment. So there was justice in its own way? In its own way, yeah. It was the underworld's version of the circle of life. Live by the sword and die by it. The four men charged and acquitted didn't have the brains to take their second chance. Anthony Farrell became a hopeless junkie. 
Trevor Pettingill was in and out of jail for the next 15 years, and Victor Pearce was shot dead in his own Holden Commodore. Naked City is brought to you by The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. Subscriptions power our newsroom, so to support independent journalism, consider subscribing to the Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. This episode was produced and edited by Anu the Axe Hasbolt, Machine Gun Margaret Gordon. It was mixed by Cool Hand Cormac Lally, archives by Nine and 3AW. Tom McKendrick is head of audio. I'm John Sylvester. Thanks for listening.